packets. I gave all that information to Marin in order to explain indirectly that I have no knowledge of archaeology. Mm -hmm. I'm not an archaeologist. I am, however, a user of archaeology. Uh, uh, it's part of what I do uh, in terms of deep mapping. So in a sense, I'm here uh, somewhat tentatively um, to see whether there is some kind of dialogue to be opened up between the kind of work that I'm involved in and involved in helping doctoral students do and the kind of things that you do and are interested in. Okay. Um, in archaeological narratives and other ways of telling, Mark Pluchenik argues that a more democratic approach to narrative might offer fresh opportunities to reflect on the roles and possibilities of both narrative and non-narrative writings of archaeology. I want to extend his argument in two ways, by linking it to Gemma Karadi Fiumara's call that we return to a listening that attempts, I quote, to recover the neglected and perhaps deeper roots of what we call thinking. Also to the geographer Karen Till's argument that acknowledging the historic wounds associated with particular sites enables the memory work needed to create healthy places, citizens and states. This extension frames my thinking about how, how this site might be visualised. I also want to suggest how listening to old ballads might help us better evoke its complexities and paradoxes. Last month, Professor Arthur Watson gave a presentation that focused on two songs preserved by the Scottish traveller community, an oral tradition he's been participating in since he was 15. This oral tradition has passed down old ballads like Tam Lin from singer to singer for many hundreds of years. We can't say how many hundreds of years because it's all in an oral tradition. Pro Professor Watson sees that tradition as the antithesis of academic thinking. And I have to say, I'm coming round to sharing his view. What follows works with the resulting tension by adopting what I would call a disciplinary agnosticism, one that counterpoints careful attention or listening and information derived from disciplinary knowledges, including archaeology. The kirkyard of St Mary's of the Lowes overlooks St Mary's Lock in the Scottish borders and is situated just off the A708 between Selkirk and Moffat. It sits in the valley of the Etterick and Yarrow, a location central to a variety of ballads, from the pre-16th century ballads like Tam Lin through to late 17th century ballads like the Battle of Philiphau. In short, the kirkyard can be said to be located in a physical landscape and in a long-established vernacular songscape. The site is currently the object of two quite distinct narratives. The first is the online archaeological account given by the Borders Archaeology Company. Although the anonymous author is, clear, is careful to make clear that the account is provisional, it nevertheless tacitly evokes the objective authority of fact, as given by the academic disciplines of history, archaeology and etymology. This narrative begins by citing archival evidence for the existence of the now vanished chapel in 13th century documents and works its way back in time, citing both archaeological and etymological evidence to support the provisional findings. The narrative proposes that the Kirk, abandoned in 1640, once stood near an earlier kel or cell occupied by a, her a hermit. The name Lowes derives from the Cumbric term for a lake. Additionally, the site was originally located in the Cumbric diocese of Glasgow, which also suggests a Cumbric origin for the cell. This may have been established as early as the 6th century. 
Archaeological material in the surrounding landscape is taken to suggest that the site may have had some pre-Christian significance. The second narrative, provided by the Etterick and Yarrow Community and Development Company, is present at the site itself. Its framing assumptions are those of a border heritage industry that needs to cater to a specific American constituency one that visits the borders largely in search of its roots. Archaeology plays no part in that framing. This information board is part of a set distributed around a circular walk of the area that starts and ends at the statue of James Hogg, also known as the Ettrick Shepherd, located at the head of the loch. As you can see, it presents the site as a peaceful and ancient place of worship, and encourages visitors to rest a while and let its magic work on you. It goes on to evoke two major heritage, heritage tropes, Scottish nationalism and radical Protestant dissent. In the first case, by positing a link between the site and William Wallace. In the second, by mentioning the annual blanket preaching in commemoration of the Covenanters. This second trope also helps to give an added authenticity to the site, showing it as the locus of a pious act of remembrance. The reference to a tragic romance connected to the extended and long-established Douglas family, who are still major local landowners, adds specific colour. I'll come back to this reference later. What interests me, however, is what is absent from both these narratives. As I've already mentioned, this site is located within a rich vernacular songscape dominated by pre-16th century border ballads that belong to a group sometimes called the supernatural ballads. These are old, layered and fractured <coughs> sung narratives that still carry trace elements of an old quasi-animist life world. Traces of a life world that while vividly present in oral tradition, lies right at the margins of factually based disciplinary narratives. I'm particularly interested in these quasi-animist traces, however, because they resonate with current theorizations of a sensible materialism, linked to ecological concerns by thinkers such as Isabel Stengers, Jane Bennett, Donna Haraway and Bruno Latour. I see these traces as potential temporal bridges linking a neglected past, current high theory, an emergent attitude present in contemporary popular culture. Something of this emergent attitude is implicit in two verses from the song Resurrection by the American singer Rita Hoskin. I'm not going to sing, don't worry. <laughs> I'll have no rebirth, but I will be in the bark of trees and the breath of air. I'll not be in a church, but in the cells of leaves, and maybe I'll see you there. Significantly, Huskin relates her work to the tradition of Appalachian mountain music, which in turn draws on the old border ballads, among other sources. This is a detail from an old postcard of the James Hogg Memorial at the head of St Mary's Lock, alongside an illustration by Vernon Hill for a book of the old ballads that James Hogg helped collect. The valley in which St Mary's Kirkyard sits is haunted by two ballads in particular, Dowie Dens of Yarrow and Tam Lin. Before Hogg became the public figure commemorated here, he was the shepherd grandchild of Willow Farp, reputedly, like a great many others, it has to be said, the last man in Scotland to converse with the fairies. Which is to say that as a child he internalised a heterodox ontology radically at odds with that of the strict monotheism of Calvinism. The landowning and professional classes memorialised at St Mary's Kirkyard internalised Calvinism a century before Hogg's birth. But some of the rural labouring classes resisted 
the Calvinist assault on their heterogeneous culture. They sang old ballads populated by transgressive women, revenants, prophetic dreamers, and uncanny figures like Thomas the Rhymer, who, aided by the Queen of Elfland, entered the world of the good neighbours, which is the polite way of referring to the fairies. You don't refer to them directly. I probably need to clarify something at this point. These photographs of Tamlin's well in Carterhow Wood on the Etterick, downstream from St Mary's Lock. Sir Walter Scott indicated, and numerous people still choose to believe, that this is where a young woman called Janet, Janet, or Lady Margaret met Tamlin, the young grandson of the Earl of Roxburgh, who had been abducted by the Queen of Elfland. I'm no more interested in such literalism than I am in the dismissal of the old ballads as picturesque but archaic nonsense. I hear these songs as evoking traces of an old quasi-animist life world, one regarded by the authorities, then as now, as heretical, marginal, foolish or otherwise unacceptable. Listen carefully and ballads like Tamlin offer up traces of a life world that's largely absent from both the historical and the archaeological record. These traces are, however, now receiving growing attention as scholars like Emma Wilby analyse and contextualise overlapping folkloric material common to both the ballads and testimony given by individuals accused of witchcraft. As part of an oral tradition, however, these traces can never become fact. The information board I showed earlier refers to events narrated in a ballad called the Douglas Tra Tragedy. This tells the story of the elopement of Lady Margaret Douglas, during which her lover kills her father and seven brothers, only to be mortally wounded himself in good form, Margaret then dies of grief. The information board suggests that the lovers may have been buried in St Mary's Kirkyard. Another ballad, The Diadems of Yarrow, has a broadly similar part, but differs in being both framed and fractured by the devices of a prophetic dream. In this dream, a mother and daughter learn that the daughter's lover, a ploughboy, has fought with nine local gentlemen for the right to marry her. The ploughboy kills three of these men, three withdraw, and he badly wounds three more, at which point he's stabbed from behind by the girl's brother. Two significant qualities distinguish this ballad from the Douglas tragedy. Firstly, it introduces class into a narrative conventionally concerned with generational conflicts over inheritance in powerful landowning families. Secondly, the landscape plays an active role in the narrative, particularly the Dowie dens themselves. In, Eng in English, uh, dismal, narrow, wooded valleys. These elements echo a pre-Christian ontology typified by the opening lines of the anon anonymous 8th century Irish ballad, Donald Ogg. In English, these translate as, It is late last night the dog was speaking of you. The snipe was speaking of you in her deep marsh. It is you are the lonely bird throughout the woods, and that you may be without a mate until you find me. I want to suggest that, in addition to offering an alternative vernacular context, within which to narrate this site. Ballads also offer an alternative and arguably more democratic approach to narrative visualisation. I want to focus on that suggestion for the time that's left to me. While Dalyadens of Yarrow and Tanlin clearly have a beginning, middle and end, they also have a powerful sense of being embedded within an oral tradition in which the strict linear sequence of past, present and future can be disrupted by magic or prophecy. From this point of view, the Douglas tra uh, 
Tragedy and Doe Dens of Yarrow reflect competing ontologies. An additional complication, as these images by four different illustrators suggest, is that attempts to visualise a supernatural ballad like Tamlin by using a single visual language doesn't work. Illustration, illustrators are expected to maintain stylistic cons consistency and so try to achieve a sense of effective or conceptual unity. But such ballads do not employ a single perspective, voice or effective register. Instead, they deploy multiple voices and evoke affects across a weave of many, sometimes mutually contradictory or antagonistic perspectives. In Tamlin, we can hear the Christian orthodoxy of the landowning class rubbing up against the quasi-pagan heterodoxy of a vernacular peasant culture. Simultaneously, we hear exchanges between various gendered and socially differenti differentiated voices, human and non-human, warning, defying, exposing, mocking, promising and threatening. This complex polyvocality unsettles the linearity of the narrative. It is further unsettled by the fact that different ballads often share lines or even whole verses, suggesting that they belong to a larger mesh of story. Each ballad also exists in numerous variations. All these characteristics allow singers to inflect meaning. For example, in some versions of Tamlin, Janet actively seeks him out, despite an explicit warning about his sexual proclivities. In others, Lady Margaret is the passive victim of a magic seduction or of rape. A skillful singer can inflect the version being sung within a matrix of other variations that, although unsung, resonate in the listener's memory. Consequently, the song's meaning... Sorry. <coughs> Consequently, the song's meaning is constantly open to question and contestation reflected the nature of our own narrative identities. Arguably, then, our experience of hearing such ballads is creatively tensioned between an unstable lyric narrative woven from multiple voices and positions shot through with references tacit and explicit to numerous other, perhaps antagonistic, variations, and all of this within a single, sorry, within a complex non-linear songscape. I'm going to. <coughs> I'm not. An alternative narrative of the Kirkyard of St Mary's of Fellows might amplify provisional archaeological information as follows. By listening to Tamlin, reference could be made to the longevity of elements of a pre-Christian life world in the region and to its relationship to Cumbric Christian theology. By listening to the Diadems of Yarrow, questions could be raised about the continuing relationship between class, land ownership and a monolithic conception of nationalism. Covenanter history in the valley, celebrated at the annual blanket preaching, is echoed in a late ballad about Sir David Leslie's victory at Philiphow on the banks of Ettrick Water. This ballad makes no reference, however, to the murder of 50 Irish royalists who surrendered on being promised safe quarter, nor to the killing of 300 camp followers, mainly women and children, who are then thrown into a mass grave. This information may seem unconnected to St Mary's Kirkyard as a peaceful and ancient place of worship. However, it was his army's covenant and ministers who encouraged Sir David Leslie to authorise these sectarian murders. In re-narrating this site through old ballads, I'm trying to encourage another way of hearing the past. Following Mark Plitschnek, I suggest that in order to evoke a genuinely democratic and humanitarian relationship to archaeological sites, we need to interweave multiple stories and images that invite individuals to listen out for and relish the evocation of multiple heritages and conflicting interpretations. Thank you.